thank you the organizers yeah for setting up this conference despite the travel bans and everything so i was really looking forward to being santa barbara now but unfortunately i have to give this talk from home uh so <clears throat> Uh, as you see from the title, yeah, I'll be speaking about uh, super diffusion and actually some very interesting aspects of super diffusion, which seems to be sort of uh, uh, something that you can a little bit provocatively call super universality, and I will try to explain what I mean by that. So since I have only 20 minutes, I decided just to basically cover one paper. Actually, that paper was already published last year, so it's not a very new thing, so I apologize for, for experts because they will not learn anything new. But still, I mean, since this is a bit more, let's say, mathematical paper, maybe it was not really noticed uh, more broadly. I mean, uh, since there's, I mean, this this aspect which I mentioned, this super diffusion, uh, sorry, this super universality, super diffusion, maybe you know, it's, it's worth stressing. So, I mean, as you see, I mean, the buzzword here also is Kada Parisi Junk Universality. So it seems that uh, in inter and, uh, another buzzword is integrability, and another one is non-abelian symmetries. So if you combine integrability and non-abelian symmetries, what we claim is that you get generically uh, KPZ universality. And for people who follow this, this story of KPZ for, for, for several, I mean, almost decades now, I mean, they know I mean, a couple of years ago, people have connected KPZ universality to Femi Pasta Ulam type problems, to unharmonic oscillators. I would like to just make a disclaimer. I mean, this is a different aspect of KPZ universality because here we need integrability. So, I mean, it's kind of bizarre. I mean, you know, for, for unharmonic lattices, which are non-integrable, but they have three conserved quantities, people have shown that you have KPC transport, but now you have integrability, which means you have infinitely many conserved quantities, but you need non-abelian symmetries, and then you have KPC transport. So, and this is just, I mean, my talk is not about uh, any proofs. It's not about any, any, any physical mechanisms. It's just about some simple, simple mathematical model, which basically can be easily simulated and uh, a very good data can be obtained to, 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 to make conjectures, let's say. <clears throat> so let me just, before going into, the, into this model, so that the class of models, let me just basically couple, uh, use a couple of slides for history. I mean, I think this was one of the first papers where this uh, super diffusion in integrable systems was noted. This was a, a paper with Bojan Junkovic, uh, where we looked at a classical version of lambda, basically a classical version of XXZ model, which is this so-called lattice lambda Lifshitz model, which is the anisotropic version of classical spin, classical magnet. And so there is a parameter which you can tune, and basically there the motivation was different. There we wanted to see whether it is a is ballistic to diffusive crossover similar to to in XXZ. So there is this little delta, which is basically like a logarithm quantum delta. When there is positive, it's like easy axis. When there's negative, it's like easy plane, and when there's zero, it's like isotropic. So when we, then we found that correlation functions. Well, I mean you can plot this uh, um, space-time correlation functions if you want, but the main plot is this one. So the correlation function of spin, spin, I mean, integrated over space. So time correlation function of the magnetization, either sub plateaus for easy plane or the case quite quick for easy axis. Uh, and it decays like power law with the, with the slope, which seems to be like two thirds. I mean, at that time we, were, we didn't even pay attention to that two thirds. I mean, it's basically best fit was 0 0.65, but later, uh, we pointed, I mean, I mean, there have been other studies which I will mention, which uh, basically suggested that this should be like a KPZ dynamic exponent, uh, which is one over two thirds, which is three over two. <clears throat> and then I think one should also mention the paper by, by Marco, who uh, looked actually even before uh, at Lindblad equation for the XXX model, the, the isotropic Heisenberg magnet, and actually also found that the steady state current decays not like one over N, N is the system size, but in the case like one over root n. And if, if one does some, some scalings, one sees that this is totally compatible with dynamic exponent three over two. So I mean, that was, I guess, the first hint that there should be something like three over two dynamic exponent, but maybe one, you know, I mean, there is still some issues whether steady state Lindblad is really a, 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 a correct description or, or let's say uh, it, it captures all the, all, all the features of, of, of thermodynamics uh, of, 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 of open systems. Of closed systems, but let's say I, mean, I don't want to, to get into the, this, the, this discussion here. So, <clears throat> but then I think this was the paper actually where this uh, conjecture was kind of first put out really clear and loud. Uh, this is our paper from 2019 where we looked at uh, a really uh, 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 inhomogeneous uh, uh, quench uh, spin transport in XXX uh, Heisenberg model and its discrete time integrable variant. 
uh, we looked at the spin, again, the decay of spin correlation functions, we found dynamic exponent three over two, and also the, the profiles were kind of those which were predicted for, for KPZ uh, universality. I mean, which is those which are tabulated by Prahofer and Spohn. <clears throat> okay, so, and there were many other papers. Uh, I mean, after 2019, I think now there are, I mean, much more papers than I listed here. These are just the first papers probably which came out. Uh, which basically uh, try to understand this this phenomenon. They put out some 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 also some heuristic mechanisms. Uh, I think one should probably mention papers by 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 Roman uh, Vasur and Sarango Palakrishnan, who were the first who kind of derived dynamic expo dynamic exponent three over two uh, based on quasi particle picture. But I should also stress that this derivation only applies to quantum models and somehow classical models, even though you might think they are conceptually simpler. They maybe are more difficult because it's not so clear what are really the correct quasi particles. <clears throat> I mean, the integrability seems to be a bit more obscure. But anyway, so I mean, at least what is understood now is more or less that the dynamic exponent should be three over two. Uh, and also, one should also probably stress the last paper, the PRX of MA, Roman, Sarank, and, and company, who uh, also derived this super universality in the sense that they pointed out that the three over two should be universal across all the non abelian symmetries. <clears throat> Again, uh, based on the quantum description of the, of the models. And uh, moreover, I mean, one should probably also stress very recent experiments uh, by, by, by uh, quantum gas microscopy, where um, uh, 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 people have actually been able to, to kind of very nicely demonstrate this dynamic exponent three or two and uh, the KPZ scale. <laughs> So anyway, but this talk is not about uh, physics uh, of, K I mean, it's not about physical mechanisms for KPZ transport in integrable systems. It's just about a simple and cute integrable system with one of symmetry, which maybe, you know, maybe the simplest, the minimal model, which has all that kind of, uh, one can tune also not only the, I mean, one can tune actually the, the, the symmetry group if you want. I mean, that's why, again, now I'm trying to explain what I mean by super universality. I mean that you have, dynamic exponent, which is insensitive to the symmetry group of the model. So the model can have any SUN or even the symplectic USPN and so on. Any compact symmetry group, uh, we have the same, that's the claim, that's a conjecture. We have the same, uh, the same universality. Okay, so since I, again, I just want to be like 10, a little more than 10 minutes more. So let me just give you three slides about the uh, properties of this model. The, first of all, definition of this model. So the model actually basically again falls in, into the category of this kind of circuit model. So if you want the kind of cellular automaton models, I mean, time is discrete, space is discrete. So you only have to specify the fundamental uh, uh, fundamental dynamical laws, which apply, let's say, to two, two neighboring sites. So now imagine that in, in each side of your lattice, now the lattice is 1D, and also time is a lattice. So you apply uh, a, a map uh, discreetly in time. So imagine that in each, in each time step, you apply a map to a two neighboring spins. And this map is like a map which, which acts on two matrices. So the local degree of freedom is a matrix. I will specify more concretely what space of matrices, what symmetric space I have to, I have to take it from. But let's just assume this is these are two, two matrices for the moment. And now let me just you know, throw from the air, throw this, this, this rational transformation of these two matrices, M1 and M2. I'm sorry, there is a typo here. So on the left-hand side, there should be primes. So this would be a mapping that we, which maps M1 and M2 to M1 prime and M2 prime. So it's, a, it's really a simple you know, rational transformation, which is like a swap because you swap, first you do the swap and then you conjugate, conjugate with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a sum of matrices plus some I times tau, where tau is a formal parameter. Now this tau will play a role of time, of time step, but anyways. <clears throat> So this map, this is a, now a, a kind of, I mean, I will show you this map has nice properties. For example, this map is a symplectic map. So it defines kind of generalized Hamiltonian dynamics. Yeah? So it has all the nice properties of physics that you would like. Okay, but also this map also has some other nice properties. For example, if you invert it, then it just, you know, and this map is parametrically dependent, right? It depends on the external parameter tau. So if you invert it, then it corresponds to minus tau. Then it conserves the property of matrices. If they square to one, also the image matrices square to one. And if the matrices are Hermitian, then also the image matrices are Hermitian. So this hints you into which direction you should look for compact space, phase space. And moreover, I mean, it also conserves, if you want, the generalized spin. It conserves the sum of matrices. Now, I mean, the, the, you can already see if you have two by, two by two matrices with these properties that they square to one, 
and the their Hermitian, then this would be like classical spins, right? This would be like a vector of Paulis, I mean, arbitrary Paulian arbitrary direction, which is determined by a vector on the sphere. So then this would be like a, a classical spin. And this, this fourth property would be, like, would be like conservation of classical spin under these two side, two side interactions, right? These are two side interactions. Now, what is the phase space? Now, the phase space in general is what uh, is known as complex Grassmannian. So it's parameterized not only by dimension of the matrix, but by the rank of the matrix, but, but also by the rank of the matrix. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is not precisely rank, but it is number of negative uh, versus positive eigenvalues of these matrices. So these matrices have to square to one. So the eigenvalues are only plus or minus one. Uh, so you can decide how many eigenvalues minus one you want. And this gives you a rank of the Grassmannian because the Grassmannian is basically the, this matrix plus identity. And then this becomes a projector. So M square equal one. If you add identity becomes P square equal P. So this is a projector. Okay, so now you can basically write a normal form of these matrices, which is given in terms of an SUN SU transformation. So you take, this is a, a, a diagonal, uh, I mean, this matrix is, is similar to a diagonal with plus and minus ones. This is what we sometimes call it signature. And then uh, there is uh, this uh, G, little g, which is basically, yeah, paramet parameterizing you your phase space, a, a, a general SUN spin, classical SUN spin. Okay, it's a compact uh, variable. It's, uh, it, 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 it resides in compact phase space. And then you can define the matrix. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so if you want the dimensionality of this phase space, I mean, it's two times capital N minus K times K. So the simplest example is when the matrices are two by two and rank is one, then this dimension is two. So this is the dimension of a sphere, of a, of a surface of a sphere, <clears throat> all right? So this is a classical spin. Classical spin is a, a, a point on a sphere. <clears throat> this is a simple, this is an SUN case, SU2 case. And then you can study SU3, uh, comma one, SU4, comma one, comma two, and so on. <clears throat> and then, okay, you see why this was like a two by two, and now you, you define a circuit out of these two by two transformations, similarly as you define big work circuits, but now this is not a quantum, it's a classical, so it's basically a symplectic map, which you basically built out of a, 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 a direct product, if you want, or, or, or not tensor product, really, but yeah, direct product of these two by two maps. <clears throat> Okay, and then you can define a space-time dynamics. This M now has two indices, lower index is a spatial, upper is a temporal index, and then, you know, <clears throat> this is how it goes. I guess I should not go into too much uh, details with definitions. I mean, I, I hope uh, this is clear enough, all right? I mean, you define now the, the, the mapping, the full mapping, which I'd call capital Phi, which is now a composition of even and odd, right? Because now you see you still do it in the staggered way. First you apply it to even pairs, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, and then two odd pairs, two, three, four, five, and so on. And then, you know, each square here, each plaquette here is one application or each each, 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 each uh, red uh, box is one application of a two, two, two matrix map. Okay, <clears throat> right, so now you do it in this way. And now the next statement is, I mean, this is of course, I mean, it's very simple, but you know, the first thing you can easily see from that, I mean, I could also reverse the, the discussion, of course, I could start from very abstract notion of integrability and to zero curvature, and then I could derive the map, but I didn't do that. I just throw the, the map on, on, on the slide. And now what I will do next, I will show that this map actually derives from a parallel transport or zero curvature condition with respect to some super simple Lux operator. So that's basically the language of integrability. So if you can propose a Lux operator and say that the map derives from a zero curvature condition for that Lux operator, then basically you have shown that this map should be integral, that this dynamics should be integral. So in this case, it's really simple. So the lux operator is like, I mean, you have basically, you can, again, you can, can imagine you have this space-time lattice, and now you should basically imagine you have some sort of auxiliary transport problem. Uh, and these lux operators are actually acting as propagators on this auxiliary, on, on, on this, on this, on this, along these two directions. So there, are two, there are two directions, there is two diagonals. There is this way and there is that way. And what you want to, to, to claim is that, you know, and there are these two propagators, which I call L plus, which are these diagonals, and L minus, which are these diagonals. And first, I will assume that there is a symmetry between these two diagonals. So L plus and L minus is the same, it's just L. Depends on formal parameter lambda and depends on, depends on matrix M. So it's, a, yeah, so it's a Lux matrix, right? So, and I will propose that it should be a linear inspector parameter and linear in a variable. So just lambda plus M. Yeah? And then there is this, constraint, which is one which brings nonlinearity in this business, which is asking that M squared should square to one. 
And then the, the, the thing is now that you should ask that, uh, uh, I mean, the zero curvature condition or, or, or part of the transport property, that is that if you go from here to here this way, you should basically arrive to the same vector as you go that way, right? So that means that uh, these two product of lux operators should be the same as this product of lux operators. But, but these lux operators carry the matrix, the matrix variable. So if you go that way, you carry the old variables. If you go this way, you carry the new variables. So this gives you the mapping between old and new variables. So if you do a little bit of algebra, I mean, I, it's almost everything that what you need is on the slide. If you do a little bit of algebra, you find that you get exactly the transformation that I wrote. In the transformation, which was on the first slide, this one. Uh, but moreover, I mean, the general procedure is a little bit more general. So you can also uh, uh, assign to this mapping uh, what we call a twist, uh, uh, some transformation F, some non-invertible transformation F, such that what the, 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 the overall transformation that you derive basically is, is a swap between the two matrices and composition with, with uh, F times product of sum of matrices plus IT identity. So, I mean, why do we need a twist? The twist, just to tell you in terms of kind of physical intuition, twist is a magnetic field. So if you take SU2, then twist would be just a magnetic field, adding a magnetic field. Otherwise, it's some sort of a generalized magnetic field. So you can play with it. I will show you some numerics. I guess I should hurry up to be able to show you some numerics, but sure. Uh, so how much time do I have? Uh, well, three, three minutes, it could be like five, six. It's okay. Okay, so I just finish that time. <clears throat> okay, so now I will probably skip some of the slides, which is again, sort of, uh, to, to, to mathematical probably, but you know, it's just to tell you that, uh, I mean, if you are, if you want to have a nice model with all the nice properties, then you also want to have a Poisson bracket, right? And uh, here's the explicit expression for the Poisson, Poisson bracket. You want to have invariant measure. So you want to know that this is really an honest dynamical system with a, with a symplectic structure and with an invariant measure. And, uh, <clears throat> and then after you have this, you can actually prove that this map is symplectic yeah, with respect to this measure and Poisson bracket. <laughs> And okay, and then, uh, you know, if you want to really claim that you have integrability, what physicists would like to have is a complete set of, or, or at least an extensive set of conserved, conserved quantities, right? Well, first of all, you want to have a transport matrix, and out of this, you derive conserved quantities. So I will just show you in one slide that you can have that. First of all, you just take a product, you take a, a string of matrices M, which determines some point in time, right? Now, point in time is a string of matrices because it's like a many body system. And to it, to, to it, you assign a matrix, which you call a monotony matrix, which depends on spectral parameter. And this is a product of lux operators. And these lux operators should have staggered spectral parameters. So first one should have lambda, but the second one should have lambda plus tau, and then again, lambda, lambda plus tau, lambda, lambda plus tau. So there should be a staggering determined by the time step. Right? I mean, that's very similar to what people do in, in trotterizing um, X, X, Z and uh, make, ensuring that it's still integrable, it's still one needs this, this sort of staggering of transfer of, of spectral parameters. But after that, you can actually show that if you take a trace of this monotony, then you get a phase space function. So I don't want to call it a transfer matrix, it's a function of space space variables, but it's easy to show that this function is conserved, conserved exactly under time evolution. So it's, it's basically like commuting with the Hamiltonian if you want, but there is no Hamiltonian, it's just conserved. And moreover, the, the definition of Poisson bracket ensures you that this, the, this way defined transfer map, I rather call it transfer map, not transfer matrix. This transfer map is Poisson commuting with, its, Poisson commuting with itself for any pair of spectral parameters. So this is basically is the, your substitute of your transfer matrix that generates conservation laws. And if you take uh, normal derivatives, I mean, uh, logarithmic derivatives of that thing that you get actually, then you obtain actually local conservation laws. These are not all, all that are, they are not always local. They are only local when your uh, complex Gassmannian space has rank one. So when these projectors, which parameterize your phase space, have rank one. So this is a very interesting issue. I don't want, I have no time to get into it because you know, if I have high rank, then I suspect that these cons conservation laws are only pseudo-local, maybe not even that, but we have at the moment no tool to, to analyze that, but at least they are not local. Okay, then you, know, you have also some sort of young Baxter equation, which actually we don't need. We don't know what is good for. Uh, and then you have some space-time duality, which we also don't need. I mean, at least we don't know we don't know how to use it. And then you have continuous space, continuous time versions of that model. For example, you can take continuous time version. You can parameterize your twist like e to the i tau b, where b is some Hermitian matrix, which is like a SUM magnetic field. And then what you get at the end is this kind of Hamiltonian model, which is very similar to lattice lambda lifshitz model. It's a generalization of lambda lambda lifshitz model. 
uh, lattice standard which is model to SUN. Okay, and uh, well, whatever. I mean, then you can take a special case of SU2, then you get classical spins, which you could, uh, you could uh, parameterize them by uh, these capital S vectors, which are uh, uh, normalized vectors, so that is points on a sphere. And then our rational transformation, which gives us the symplectic two spin map, is this explicit transformation, which only involves dot product and vector product. So it's probably the simplest rational function, which is SU, 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 SO3 symmetric. <coughs> Uh, okay, and uh, this is uh, for, on that model. We had a paper a couple of months before that with Giga, who's a graduate student. Uh, <clears throat> and then afterwards, with, with an A, we have somehow generalized it. But, uh, that is a special case. <clears throat> okay, now let me give you for the for the end some some numerics. So, for example, now just this is just uh, 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 now what what you can do basically you can take charges, right? I mean uh, spin charges, uh, spin uh, spin components, if you want which are these Q alpha. Now you take some X alpha, some traces matrices. Now for SU2, this will be Pauli matrices. For SU3, it will be Delman matrices. So, I mean, in general, this would give you some, this would be some generalized Delman matrices, which would give you components of SU and spin. Then you can take a correlation function of this SU and spin. And if you plot it like, uh, for, uh, like diagonal correlation function for the equal components, then you get density, which has these uh, uh, characteristic shapes with, with the envelope, which is scaling like uh, t to the two, three, three halves. There is, uh, or t to the two thirds, I mean, depending on. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, uh, for example, I mean, if you just look at the, how the correlation function decays on the, on the, on the, on the shoulder, on this, uh, uh, in the center, this gives you actually the directly uh, probe of dynamical exponent. Then you find that you get this, and this is numerics, and on dash line is the best fitting uh, power law, and this has slopes like in two digits precision, two thirds. <clears throat> I mean, this is all, I mean, these are different graphs which corresponds to different uh, non abelian symmetries, like, uh, and different ranks, yeah. SU, SU3, SU41, SU42, I don't know, and the, the others are also some symplectic, so I, mean, I don't I have no time to go into detail, but, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, the, the statement is, I mean, I mean again, there's no proofs, but the conjecture is that uh, one should have universality irrespective of the compact uh, group symmetry. Okay, now, uh, yeah, this is now some fine detail uh, 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 comparison of scaling of cuts of correlation functions at equal time, scaled with dynamical exponents. So this psi is a scale variable, it's x over t to the uh, one over z, z is three over two. And then compared to this Prach over Spohn, uh, correlation function, which is that chain curve, and you find we have excellent agreement, and uh, the red curve is the Gau best fitting Gaussian, which is just to convince you that it's not a Gaussian. And now the last slide is uh, 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 just showing you the effect of magnetic field, but I probably I should skip that just to, to tease you a little bit. So this 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 <clears throat> this this uh, <clears throat> magnetic field. Uh, uh, it, uh, I mean, of course, this. Uh, 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 consequence of that is that the spin is no longer conserved, but there's a pre precession of the spin, and uh, um, and so you get these oscillate these global oscillations in the correlation function <clears throat> as a consequence. Okay, so here's my conclusion. So what I try to give you is some empirical evidence that uh, 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 these matrix models, which I defined uh, for any uh, <clears throat> global symmetry, uh, exhibit KPC physics with dynamical exponent three over two. Um, I mean, they're, they're, we have not yet did, tried all possible uh, uh, compact leak symmetries, but only uh, unitary and symplectic. We should also define it for orthogonal, orthogonal uh, uh, groups, but for that one has to modify our mapping a little bit. So, uh, and then of course, this is the conjecture. Um, so, I mean, all the data shows now that uh, all discrete space-time models built as Floca circuits from two-body symplectic young Baxter maps with dynamical variables taking values from compact non abelian symmetric spaces exhibit super diffusion of the KPZ type in equilibrium states with unbroken symmetry. So one, what is important is that the initial state or the state in which you compute correlations has non abelian symmetry <clears throat> and that you are in equilibrium. So that's again kind of funny because you know KPZ was originally devised as a non equilibrium universality class. Here we find that it is applies only at equilibrium. So that is a linear transport equilibrium correlation functions. Okay, and then proofs, we are still waiting for ideas. <laughs> right, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, so we have time for questions. 
Uh, maybe while well, people are thinking, I'll ask again. Uh, first, uh, I mean, one thing we, we kind of found accidentally for diffusion, but I guess it applies to KPZ as well, that in integrable systems, once you re reach the boundary, so you basically relaxed, uh, dynamics starts to be very different. So like in non-integrable systems, you basically exponentially decay for diffusion in time. Uh, and it means spectral function is constant, so you go to random matrix. But for integral model, we always found that spectral function goes to zero, so dynamics should be very, very different at long times. I just wonder if this is something you ever thought about, is it something you can test? And that's an interesting question, but it's totally uh, a different uh, different scaling, a different regime, right? I mean, here what we want to do is take thermodynamic limits so that we never see the... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's different. So you, you just never thought about this? Right? We, we think about this, these issues in different contexts, but uh, in terms of quantum chaos and the ETH and all that, but but not in, oh. this, not in this field. So maybe we can discuss it later. But it's, okay, okay. It's so I think Vedika has a question. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that um, while we understand the three halves, the exponent in various ways, uh, the theoretical understanding for the full KPZ universality class is still not really fully established or accepted. Um, is that is that right? And, you know, in, in these classical models, are, is there any setting where there's actual, uh, where we really theoretically know why you get the KPZ universality? You're right, you're right. I mean, we have, we have at the moment no idea why this applies to these classical models. Uh, we have understanding of uh, three or two for quantum models and, uh, mm -hmm. based on quasi-particle picture. But that. even that doesn't cover the full KPZ universality class, right? It's just yeah, the, of course. the exponent. It's just the exponent. Yes, of, right. course. Okay. of course. We have no idea why KPZ. No. Okay, thanks. Any additional questions? I think Marcos has a question. Yeah, hi, uh, Tomas. So, I mean, these integrable models, right, they, they have infinite conserved quantities, and of course, then we'll have all these ballistic currents, right? So do we understand um, which objects will, uh, will exhibit this uh, super diffusion, right? So you have it for, for the spin current, but can you, can you tell in general? So I give you an integrable model. Um, you know the concept uh, charges and so on. So which are going to be the objects that will have uh, super diffusion? That's a, that's a very good question, but I think, uh, well, you see, there are these, 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 these two classes of observables, the so-called even and odd observables. I mean, um, and I believe that one should have only, I mean, they, they believe this should be true only for the so-called odd observables, observables which are kind of odd under spin reversal, that is linear, linear in spin variables. I mean, in, in SUN models, you have n squared minus one over two spin variables or, or something like that. I mean. So all this number of traceless uh, uh, matrices, but uh, this is about it. I think uh, you can't, I mean, I mean again, I mean, uh, what we understand quite well now is the SU2 case. I mean, SU2 case, uh, right. I mean, there you know that uh, you have uh, spin magnetization and then you have the transfer matrix, which is even under, under flip of the spin. So uh, the spin behaves very differently than, than, than the transfer matrix, uh, right? So, so I mean, I, to tell you honestly, we have not really seriously to looked into anything which would be even. So uh, in, with respect to spin reversal. So uh, I would guess, if you ask me, what my best guess is that KPZ only applies to auto sector. Okay, maybe last question by Leonie, then please. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> thank you. Maybe two short questions. So one is that, uh, this Dirk, is that uh, the compactness of the variable is important for KPZ in your case as well? I guess, yes, because we have to be able to define the, the averages, right? I mean, the right. states, the, the expectation value over states. So yeah, one has to, I mean, of course, I mean, I would be interested to, to see if one can go beyond that. I mean, for example, <clears throat> At some point we were thinking, but I'm not an expert, so I didn't know how to go further, but we were thinking maybe one can also do this for some sort of super matrices or something. I mean, uh, just go beyond uh, normal matrices I mean, or some, some, some other variables. But then as soon as you get some non-compact non variable, then you don't know what to do. I mean, so <clears throat> how to define the averages. Another very quick question. So <clears throat> when you're saying equilibrium, well, I appreciate that if it's a Hamiltonian, then in principle, you can look at the correlation function at, at, at a given temperature, it, it gives, and it still may decay 
in a non-trivial way. But when we are talking about uh, the driven system, okay, what do what do you mean by equilibrium? Uh, yeah, well, I mean that's kind of uh, yeah. Of course, it's not equilibrium in that strict sense because there is no Hamiltonian. Uh, I mean, what I mean is that this is these are states which are invariant under time and space translation. So um, they're invariant under, let's okay. say, under one period of time. Okay, yeah, that's uh, great, yeah, great. Yep. Kind of generalized equilibrium. So, so you very respect some, some group, uh, okay, this is some, some transfer matrix in time. Right, and it should be discrete in time. So, I mean, right. it's for one fundamental uh, period. All right, okay, that, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's thank Thomas again. I think it's time to move to the next talk. Uh,